Let's go ahead and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just come before you today. Lord, we ask for you to give us ears to hear. We ask for you to give us eyes to see and hearts to perceive. Lord, I pray that your words would be mine and mine would be yours. That we would hear clearly from the throne of God and that we would be able to understand what you are calling us to and how you have called us and how you're leading us. Help us to know you, Holy Spirit. Help us to know you better so that we would be able to walk in the fullness of the blessing that you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have been studying on Holy Spirit, and I have been, we've been talking about how Holy Spirit is a third person of the Godhead. We have been talking about how Holy Spirit, what he does is his, his design is to comfort, to teach, to lead, to guide. And in Holy Spirit himself, he is the creative force of the Godhead. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. But the Spirit of God was hovering over those waters. It started with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit created everything. And then at the end of Revelation 22, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And so we see that, again, the spirit is at the end. We also know that in Matthew, I'm sorry, John chapter 14, that we see that the Holy Spirit is the comforter that's going to be with us forever. So look at your neighbor and say, I'll bet he's really happy. Now, he is. He is really happy. Here's why. Because you were created by him for a reason. There's nothing greater than to live with the, cre- the, the, the creator, to live with his creation. That's what he desires. That's what he longs for. Now, and we're going to talk today about Holy Spirit and about how, what he, how he helps to lead us into the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is very, very important. We believe in this church in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe in prophecy. We believe in words of knowledge, words of wisdom, faith. We believe in the gift of faith. We believe in tongues, interpretation of tongues, which is what I did earlier. We believe in miracles, signs and wonders. We believe in the, in the words of discernment or discerning of spirits. We believe in these, these gifts. We believe that the gifts of healings. We believe that these gifts are still for today. These gifts are power tools. Now what's happened in the church has been the power tools that have been given to us as gifts. Sometimes it gets confused and we start to elevate the gifts over the character. Character is always going to be our number one thing. Character is is literally the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is what we have. Now I want to, I I have heard this and I've I've been waiting for this message to kind of teach us, to kind of share with us on how, how we can look at Holy Spirit. So I heard this once, and I thought this was a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, illustration of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is like a guide. Now, you and I, we are in a jungle marsh, swampy. There's all kinds of infested things that are there, creatures that want to eat you. And you step outside and be like, I think I've seen some of those creatures. They're driving right now, right? Praise the Lord. But what happens is there are, there's all kinds of things. You're in a marsh. You're in this unforeseen area. You don't know your way around. But what you have is you have a map and you have a guide. Now, I don't know about you, some of us who... If you're, if you're like under 35, you may not have any clue what I'm talking about. If you're over 35, you'll understand. Do you guys remember the big road atlases that stood about this tall and about this wide? And then when you had to find your way around, the first thing you're trying to do is find, while you're driving, that big place to where you needed to go. And you remember how it was trying to find your location in the midst of all this? And it was like, oh my gosh. Well, we have the map, praise the Lord. But sometimes in the middle of the map, we're going, I know it's in here somewhere. But the reality is, is that we're still trying to find where it's at. But we not only have the map, man, we have the guide. He's already been to the end of this thing. He's been to the end of where we're going. He's been to the end of what we're going to do. He has been to the beginning, from the beginning, and to the end. So he's going to be there with us and lead us and guide us. So Holy Spirit is our leader. He is our guide. He is the one who will will guide us through this navigating these waters called life. He's going to get us through this jungle, and we're going to get to the opposite side, and we're going to be on the land of promise that God has for us. Look at your neighbor and say, I want my land of promise. 
Now, one of the things that's happening is that we are seeing that events are taking place. There are all kinds of amazing things happening, good and bad. We're seeing that there will be great light. There's great light. That some of the universities are experiencing revival. People are getting baptized. There's amazing things happening here in the United States. We also see that there's great darkness that's taking place. Folks, this is what the Bible talked about would happen. So we're not afraid of this. We're not terrified of this. But one thing that Jesus said, he said, the love of many will grow cold. Now this is something we want to pay attention to. Look at your neighbor and say, if it's in red, pay attention. Jesus said, the love of many will grow cold. Now, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us. He has sealed us for the day of redemption. On the day of Pentecost, when, we, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, they were empowered then by the Spirit of God to do all kinds of amazing things. That is where fire fell upon them and they, divide, and they began to speak with, with cloven tongues as of fire is what the Bible says. They began to speak in a heavenly language. There was a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire that came. And in the process, God moved upon the, on the church. He started his church then. Now in the process, of him moving through all this, one of the things that's happening is that we are in times where the love of many will grow cold. We, I have never seen offense be so strong as it is right now. I have never seen people be so offended over some of the smallest of details, and I have never seen people who are offended and feel entitled to stay offended. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not entitled to stay offended. You're just not. We are not entitled to stay offended. You and I, we, we don't have that. That's not a luxury that we have. Matthew chapter 5, if you would go with me there. Now this is Jesus speaking. In verse 43, he says, You have heard that it is said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends it to his rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do, the, do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect or mature. That word perfect literally means mature. So Jesus is saying this. Now, I want to go ahead and I want to talk to us about the love of God today. Now, the word love here, many times we talk about love, we talk about agape love, unconditional love. But in this term, this is the root word of agape love. It's agapeho, it's what it, the word is in the Greek. And it means to contend for and to love dearly in spite of emotional conflicts. i read that again. Y'all just looked at me like a cow looking at a new gate. Praise the Lord. To contend for and to love dearly in spite of emotional conflicts. So when we love someone, we're going to love them in spite of emotional conflicts that we have. We're going to love past where they're at and into what God has for them. We're going to love past the offenses that they're doing and past all the hurts that they've done to you. And we're going to love into the place where we begin to pray for them, to contend for them. In other words, we are contending for their salvation. Now what's happened has been is that in 2020, we had many things happen and the church no longer contended for a nation. The church began to be distracted by so many different things. And I've talked about this. There was a lot of things that were given in prophetic ministries that had been said, that said things that did not come to pass. And it hurt the church. And we began to be more political than we did biblical. The minute you become, become more political than you are biblical, folks, I'm going to tell you, that's a dangerous place to be. When I go to these other nations, I do not plan on being Ameri I do not plan on bringing an American culture to them. I plan on coming to them with the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is not American. The kingdom of God is absolutely biblical. It is of heaven. And so I'm bringing the kingdom of God to them. Here, we want the kingdom of God here. Are there things we should vote on? Absolutely. Are there things we should look and we should understand and do our part? Absolutely. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm saying there's balance to everything. But the minute I no longer love someone because of their choice or because of their stance or even because they're on the opposite fence and they are really causing me a lot of problems. The minute 
I no longer love them, but I view them as unworthy or I'm not even concerned about their salvation. We've got to do a reality check. That's a heart check that has to happen. And so we have to look at this. Now, when I look up the word enemies, I'm going to read through some of these just to kind of give us an understanding. The word enemies literally means the hateful, the hostile. It refers to a person so hostile that they are at such high opposition with you that they will do anything to destroy you, destroy you, your reputation, your livelihood, and your family. That's pretty severe. That's an enemy. And let me read that again. It refers to a person who is hostile, so hostile that they are at such high opposition with you that they will do anything to destroy you, your reputation, your livelihood, and your family. Now that is an enemy. Now you have an enemy of your soul. And he, Satan, wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your livelihood. He wants to destroy everything about you. That is what the enemy wants to do. Now, what he does is he moves through people. And as he moves through people, folks, we want to be mature or perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. So we're going to respond, not in like manner, but we're going to respond in a way that only the grace of God can give you the ability to respond. You're not going to respond in a way that's real quick and you're just going to let them have it. No, no, no. We're going to respond in love. And we're going to begin to move forward. And then it goes on. And it says, bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. The word bless is eulogio. And it literally is where we get the word eulogy from. And it literally means to pronounce such a blessing. To ask God's blessing on a person, place, or thing. So I'm to ask for God's blessing on the very person that is my enemy, that is at such opposition with me that they will do anything to destroy me. I am to ask God's blessing on them. Now you can't do that in and of yourself. You may be able to do it for maybe a little bit until they cross that line. You know, we all have that one line where you just kind of snap. But what happens is to be able to bless someone in spite of all the persecutions that they're doing, all the things that they're doing. I want to tell you, I really began to get a hold of this when I was overseas and I was in a nation where they were killing Christians. And my first, my first trip there, there was Christians, there was bodies of, of, of Christians, dead Christians in the streets. And they were burning them and were driving by them. And what they're trying to do is they were trying to stop the Christians and they were trying to cleanse that nation of all the Christians because they hated the Christians. And while I'm in this car and I'm talking to, the, to this man, one of the things he said was he said, we just pray that, they would get, that, that, that the opposition would get saved. And I said, oh, I said, you, you guys pray for them a lot. And he said, absolutely. He said, they don't know what they're doing. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. See, they don't know what they're doing when they do things to us. They're not in their right mind. They're in the enemy's camp. The enemy's in their mind. So we're going to love them and pray for them and bless them and ask God to bring such a blessing upon them in spite of what they're doing. And I looked up the word curse. It means to impose evil or doom. Well, I'm to pray for those who are trying to impose evil or doom. And I, then I went ahead and I looked up the word pray. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pray means to offer up prayers. So you and I are to offer up prayers for those who are really causing us a lot of problems. Now, I'm going to tell you, in your mind, this is not going to make sense. Because in your mind, what happens is you think, I need to do something about this. I need to do something about this. I'm going to let them have it, or I'm going to, I'm going to write them off, or I'm going to do whatever you got to do, and you're going to begin to put up walls. But that's not what Jesus did, and that's not what we're to do. We are to offer up prayers for them. The word spitefully means, spitefully use you. To spitefully means to insult, to revile, to slander. That's what it means. When they slander you, when they revile you, when they say horrible things about you, we're not, to, we're not to come against them, come back at them. We are to love them and we are to pray for them. And you may feel like, well, I'm not defending myself, Dean. Well, here's the reality of it. You're allowing God to move in on your behalf. Now, here's the truth of this. You are doing this because they don't know what they're doing and they're going to a place called hell. 
This is not a self-righteous thing. I'm telling you, even my worst enemy on this earth is not worth going to hell. It's not worth him going to hell. I don't want anybody to go to hell, and so I want to be able to do everything I can to make sure that as much trouble, even as they're causing me, that they still make it to heaven. Because the reality of hell is real, because where they would spend, it's not just a black eye, and next thing you know, they're going to pay for that and feel sorry about it. This is hell that is eternal. This is hell that burns with a lake of fire where the worm does not, or the worm devours and does not stop. This is something that goes beyond just the here and the now. This goes on to eternity. So to love somebody past what they're doing to us right now is bringing us into a place where we see ahead and we see from an eternal perspective saying, it's It's not worth them going to hell. No matter what you do to me, I'm going to pray that you make it. You see, that's how we're going to be like our Father. Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Jesus actually prayed that they would be able to come to him. In spite of all the things that were being done, he still loved them. And we are to do the same. Now, Let me just clarify on a couple things because some people think, well, when I love somebody, I'm just going to let them do whatever to me or my family. If they're going to come in and cause bodily harm, you need to protect your family. I mean, if somebody came in, tried to do bodily harm to my kids, I would do bodily harm to them. I have no no, no reservation on that. That's what I'm doing. Okay, if someone tried to shoot and kill my family, I'm going to respond in like manner because I've got to defend my family. Now I'm talking about in a life and death situation. But we're talking about now if someone's coming at you and persecuting you and saying all kinds of horrible things about you, or if they gather around with people and they start to bully you, folks, you want to be able to stand in a place where you're not being like them. You're standing in a place where you're loving them. Now, this word persecute, spitefully use you and persecute you. This word persecute is very, very interesting. And this is what I want to kind of hit on for just a second. This is where most of the church has problems. We can love someone up to a point. And, but when the persecution begins, it changes. And this is where the church has got to understand... Folks, we've got to walk in the Spirit. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But you and I, we've got to walk in the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are great. They're, they're awesome. I love the gifts of the Spirit. I love it when the gifts of healing and the gifts of miracles are in operation. I love it when prophecy begins to flow and people begin to have visions and dreams. And I, I, I love that stuff. I love it. I'm absolutely 100% for it. I mean, I am pro-gifts. I am like, man, let's get the glory of God. Let's go after it. Absolutely. But those gifts will only enhance the Lord. But the character that has the gifts may not. So in other words, you can be as gifted as you you can be. I mean, we know singers. I can name singers who are very, very gifted in the world circuit and the world's in the musicians and everything. But there, there's no character that sustains them. Though their gifts are great, and though they would even sing a song that would maybe move you to tears, there's, there is no anointing on their lives because the anointing comes from the character that is found in the gifts or in the fruit of the Spirit. Does that make sense? That is where the anointing abides. The anointing abides when I honor those who I have nothing to gain anything from, but I'm honoring them because what happens is this is a place where I'm behaving and acting and carrying out my life like my father would. And that's where we begin to understand. So we see here, persecute literally is the word dioko, and it means to harass, it means to trouble. Now hear me out. It means to molest, and to seek after with evil intentions. That's what persecute means. And most of the time, we're okay to bless those who spitefully use us, who threaten us. Well, I'm just going to bless you, bless you. But when they've done something, when they've done something that actually hurts us and hurts us so, so much so that we're not able to move on in life, then what happens at that point in time, folks, were frozen in time. You know how many people I've talked to in my life as a, as a pastor that have been frozen in time? Years ago when I first started, I remember there was a, a woman and she did not, she was, I think she was in her late 70s and she 
uh, I, I had made a, some kind of comment about her being an older woman, and she said she was not an older woman, she was more of a mature woman, and I was like, I'm very sorry. I have since learned my lesson, praise the Lord. But what happened was, she then sat there and she began to talk to me about her being a child. And Becky is in there with me, we're sitting there, and this woman, I mean, I was just maybe a year into ministry here. I, I, I mean, we were just starting. And this woman begins to cry, and next thing I know, she begins to go back to when she was a child and what happened to her and how she was molested and abused as a child. And I'm not making light of anything, but she never came out of that place in her life. That hurt still had her at that age because that age was when she was violated. That age was when things happened to her. And she had never forgiven them, and she couldn't love past that. And so she was always, it, everything was very, she wanted to have control of everything, and everything was kind of a mask. And so what happened was, as she would talk about these things, and I would try to help her, we would try to minister to her, and we would ask her about deliverance, and we prayed for her, and, and, but that was a hurt that went on beyond deliverance. This was a hurt that was a trauma that happened to the soul. And the only way that you can really get past this is to actually love past what happened. You've got to see from the eyes of eternity. And I'm not a counselor. I don't pretend to be. Bill's a counselor. I'm not a counselor. So people who say, well, I need help in some things, we will minister to you just so you know we will minister to you. But there are times where you do need to go and find a professional counselor just because they are able to help you restore your soul. And if they can restore your soul and get you into a place to where you're able to walk with the Lord, I mean, that's the blessing of God. So there's all kinds of multiple moving parts in the body of Christ. I say that just because I want you to understand going to a counselor is not demonic. It's not bad and it's not weak. It's actually very healthy because they can help you. Okay, But what happens is, is that when we talk about this persecution, that what, that's what takes place, is that there's evil intentions that are given in this. And these evil intentions are given in such a way that what takes place is that we can't, we're not even praying for them. Folks, when we're not praying for those who have wronged us, we are really in the wrong spirit. The Bible would actually say, you know not what spirit you are of. Jesus prayed for those who spitefully used him. Jesus prayed for them. He prayed blessings on them. He prayed for those who would persecute him. He prayed for those who would do all kinds of evil things to him. But see, the church has got to come back to the place to where we allow Holy Spirit to love us. And we allow Holy Spirit to teach us to love others. And what happens is, is that when we don't allow Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us on how to love people, what happens is we begin to stop and we begin to build up walls. Now what's happened has been the church has built up all kinds of walls and so much so that what's taken place is that we've walled ourselves in and walled everybody else out. We don't want to do that. We want to be those who go out and who share the gospel with people. We want to be those who have an understanding of eternity. That even though things were done that were wronged, things have been wronged on, on, to you, to me, we've all been wronged. But even in the process of being wronged, we still love past the pain and we love into what is now the eternity, their eternity to come. We love past where we've hurt. And I want to tell you, there is nothing more honorable to the Lord than to live as a living sacrifice and love past everything that hurt you. To love past the shame that you're bearing. To love past the rejection that you had. To love, to love past the condemnation that you had. When you love past all that, you love into the place to where you're now understanding, I'm not only going to do right by them, I'm going to be right for them. Because you may be the one who will actually lead them to the Lord. You may be the one who actually, if he's a brother that's fallen or he's a brother that's causing problems, one of the things that may happen is you may be able to go and help such a brother restore them back to righteousness. And so we have to be able to look at what God is doing and what he's saying, and we have to move forward with him. Now, there's a lot of things going on. And what happens is love is not based on opinions. Love is not based on circumstances. It is not. You can try to justify this. You can try to split this however you want. But you look these words up, it absolutely lays it out bare for us. And it is where we're at. There is no way that we can just look and say, well, I'm going to be just like Jesus. If you truly want to be like Jesus, which I pray we all do, you're going to desire to love like he loved. 
I don't want to be a, a shallow Christian. I don't know about you, but man, listen, I want to be as, as, as real as they come. When I stand before the Lord, I want to be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. When I stand before the Lord, I want to be able to lay a crown down at his feet, that after the reward seat of Christ, I'm able to lay a crown down to be able to honor him for what he has done for me, because I don't have anything else to give him but my life. You don't have anything else to give Jesus but your life. So what we do with our life, what we do in this life matters. It really truly matters and it goes on into eternity. So that's why we are to love those who are offensive. We are to love those who are completely on the opposite side of the fence. And we are to keep moving forward and love them in spite of them. Not from a self-righteous perspective, but from an understanding that there is an eternity to, to gain here. A heaven to gain and a hell to shun. We want to move forward with Jesus. We want them to move forward with us. Now, if you would go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 16. It says in verse 16, it says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things you wish, but but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, hearsays, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I have told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not provoke one another, or let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So we are to walk in this place where we are being led by the Spirit. Now, this word led is a very interesting word, and it's very, very important that we understand this because most people don't really truly understand what it means to be led by the Spirit. So to be led by the Spirit literally means that I'm grabbing a hold of one's arm and I'm holding on to them, and they are leading me. And as they lead me, they're going to lead me through different areas, but I'm going to hold on to them. Remember, we're in a swampy jungle marsh area. I don't know if anybody's seen a crocodile up up close. Those things are massive. I don't want anything to do with a crocodile. I don't know if anybody's seen snakes. I hate snakes. Hate snakes. Like snakes and spiders, man. I just give me a gun. I'm in good shape. But I don't want anything to do with any one of those. You may say, will you shoot a spider? I absolutely will. And I'm shameless in saying that. I don't care the size of that thing. I'm going to blow it away. I hate spiders. So what happens is is that we're in a jungle, and we've got to hold on to him. Now, you and I are going to hold on to Holy Spirit, and we're going to grab a hold of him, and we're not going to let go. We want to hold on to him in such a way that what we are doing is we are moving forward with him step in step. We're staying in the word of God, and we're being led by him. So to be led literally means to have oneself attached by the arm. And if you look in Song of Solomon, it says, put us as a seal upon my heart, as a seal upon my arm. Holy Spirit has sealed us for the day of redemption. Well, I'm going to grab a hold of him like a seal upon his arm. I'm not going to let go. I'm going to hold on to him so that no matter where he goes, no matter what he does, I'm with him. And I'm going to move with him and I'm going to completely be with him. Even though he leads me through some of the storms I'm in. Praise the Lord. You know the Holy Spirit will lead you through into some storms? Do you know why? Because he wants you to grow up. He wants you to be more and more like your father. He's going to say, it's okay. It's okay. You can handle this one. You can handle this one. I was at a luncheon one time, or not lunch, but a restaurant with some people. And one of the pastors there, he sent me a private text. And he said, and, and because the food that they set before us was really, it was, it was just delicious. 
And he's really trying to behave and really trying to watch everything. And he sends me the text that has a screen, a little, little shot, a little picture. And says, I wish God would keep, quit thinking I'm his greatest soldier. He keeps giving me the hardest battles, you know. And, he said, and, he, and I, look, I looked, I looked over at him and he's looking at this cake. And he's just like, yes. So there's all kinds of things that we're going to face. But God leads us into battles so that we know where we're at. We grow in him and he leads us through. So he leads us. It also means to be led, literally means to be guided by a guide. He's our guide. He's going to lead us through these, these, these crazy waters we're in. It's to be guided by a guide. So that means we're going to stay with him and we're going to move with him. But out of that comes the fruit of the Spirit. Out of this relationship with Holy Spirit, out of this time in the Word, we begin to have the fruit of the Spirit. And what begins to take place is now we have love. And the love, that word love is the same word that agapo, agapo, that literally means to love someone, to contend for someone. So out of that love comes joy. Out of that joy comes peace. Out of that love comes some long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith self-control, all these things that we are needing in our lives that are the fruit of the Spirit. These are the things that come out of our relationship with God. It's an effortless change when you surrender to the Lord. But when you don't surrender to the Lord, you will respond in a, res in a response that is the works of the flesh. And you'll understand because you'll begin to have anger. You'll begin to have unforgiveness. You'll begin to justify yourself because of what you think you are have the right to do. And the reality is, None of us have the right to do that. Not me, not anybody else. You can justify it all you want to me. I, I'll just be like, mm-hmm, okay. The reality is the word says completely opposite. The reality is Jesus still loved those who hated him. Jesus still loved those who, who treated him badly. Jesus still loved them, and he still treated them good. We're to do the same. So the word joy actually means, I, I wanted to share these with us. Joy means something received from God. Joy is, joy means the cause of joy is the person who is one's joy, Jesus. True joy is only found in Jesus. He's the person that is our joy. There's no other joy I have than Jesus. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love being married to Becky, but she's not the source of my joy. Jesus is the source of my joy. Uh, he is, he's the reason. Peace is literally means a tranquil state of a, of, a, of a soul assured of its salvation through Jesus Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its early earthly lot, fearing nothing from the world because eternity is already settled. That's peace. So you're going to go in the midst of storms. You're going to go and there's going to be enemies all around you. Those who are going to do all kinds of crazy things and try to hurt you. And there's going to be all things said about you. And what you are going to do in the midst of the storm is you're going to be at peace. And you're going to be able to love them in spite of the situation. Because the eternal thing is already settled. There's nothing greater than the love of God. The love of God moves us into the place where we're able to move forward with him. And then we're going to go right into long suffering, which is steadfastness and perseverance and patience. You're going to be patient. We're going to be patient. No one likes to be patient when they're going through a trial. But it's one of those things that's worked on you because you'll have to be in the trial. And in the trial, you're going to be able to love them through the situation. When you begin to get to that point to where you die to the offense, where you die to the, what everybody else wants you to do, and you die to that thing, and you begin to respond in such a way that is just like Jesus, you're going to get out of that trial. And it's going to be something that as you get out of that trial, you're going to look and you're going to say, I now understand. Because what happens is, Anytime you've ever been in a trial, there's always something that takes place inside of us. And I used to think, well, that part of me died. I would preach it like that. But now I don't believe that. I believe what happened was the reality of the sonship or the reality of the spirit of God came alive. I, I came alive to the truth of who Jesus really is. I came alive to the fact of what he is, who he is in me. I came alive that no matter what they do to me, there's nothing greater than Jesus. I came alive to that. And when that begins to take place in us, folks, we begin to realize exactly what the Lord has for us. 
Now, gentleness means moral goodness, integrity, kindness. It's an excellence of character and demeanor. Gentleness is one who is not a slanderer or a gossip or a whisperer, but one who actually speaks well. The Bible says, by your gentleness, you have made me great. By his gentleness, he will make you great. As men, we think we got to have bravado sometimes, but the reality is, that bravado, most men who have lived life long enough look at that bravado and go, mm-hmm. I've seen that for years. Doesn't mean a hill of beans to me. But what happens is, by your gentleness, you have made me great. When we speak well of one another, when even we speak well of our enemies. So I was in a situation that uh, there was a person that I knew was in my family. And as a father, as a husband, there are certain things that, like for me, I, I'm good with, you can walk on me, you can say all kinds of bad things about me, but the minute you start crossing into my family, oh man, uh, I just get this dad bone in me that rises up, and I mean, I'm like, we're going to not only have a bad day, but your day is going to be horrible, horrible by the time I'm done with you. Like, I'm going to ruin it forever for you. Like, that's where I get to be. Now, you may say, well, that's kind of, well, I'll just supposed to be a pastor. I know, pray for me. So what happens is, what happens is that literally I was in a situation and I had a family member and there were some things that happened to them. They were assaulted in a certain way. And I was so, I, I was so angry that I wanted to go and I wanted to do something. And I just was, I was so mad at the person that did this. And I was just ready to just unleash all kinds of fury on him. I mean, I, I, I was at a point where I, I was thinking I could take him out and not think a thing about it. And I was just so, it was just, it it, it literally crossed the line in me. And I was dealing with this and I was struggling with this and I was battling with this. And, but my family member was not. My family member was actually okay. And they just looked at me and they said, I have to forgive him. I said, what do you mean you have to forgive him? They said, I have to forgive him. Because if I don't, God won't be pleased with me. And I mean, I wrestled with that. Then I got mad because they said it. <laughs> I know, pray for me, okay? Just pray for me. But, and this has been years ago, so I've grown, so you all are good. But I wrestled with this because this is someone that I love. This is someone that, I mean, I give my life for this person. And, and I was really wrestling with this and they just said, if I don't, God won't be pleased with me. I have to forgive him. And so they would speak well of the person. And when they would go around, they would hug the person. And I would just crawl inside like, what are you doing? And one, and one morning I woke up. And the Lord just spoke to me so clearly. And he said, your wrath would not give them anything. And he said to me, he said, you're holding my family member back. Because you're still stuck in that time. I said, how, how do I get past this? I have no idea how to. It is consuming me. How do I get past this? And the Lord just spoke to me. And he said, he said, literally, he said to me, this is an eternal process. Eternity is not measured by offenses. Eternity is measured by love. And I just sat there. And you may say, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, We're reading it right now. They will know us by our love. And I had to get rid and I had to let go of those things. And I had to forgive the person. And I got to a point to where when this this, there's things that happened in this person's life, I went and I prayed for them. Not I'm not being self righteous. Uh, Please hear me out. I'm giving you by the grace of God this happened. And I, I struggled. I struggled. And when I went to them, though, I did not have the struggle anymore. I actually had the peace of God, and I actually loved them. I knew that where they were going was eternity, and I knew that when they went, they would not be able to, they would not stand before the Lord right. And so I went to them, and then they were on their, their deathbed. And I said, I'd like to be able to pray with you to receive Jesus. And the person didn't want anything to do with it. And I said, well, can I at least pray with you? And they agreed to let me pray with them, so I prayed with them but they went on to eternity. But I wasn't mad anymore. I actually was very grieved that they would go 
to an eternal damnation. I was very grieved by that. Because nothing is worth hell. Nothing is worth hell. And so, the Holy Spirit, he led me, he, he guided me through the marsh. He guided me through that jungle, that maze. He guided me through all the creatures that were trying to hold me back. And he brought me into a place where you have to love. They'll know us by our love. How will they, not, how will they know us if we don't have love? Even love for one another. Sometimes we've got to let ourselves be wronged just so that we can continue to walk in love. Sometimes being a peacemaker means sometimes I'm going to let you say whatever you want to about me. I'm not going to go anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere with me. I'm going to keep loving you in spite of it. Because what's happening is, is there is an eternal place where we're looking at. And I want you to make it. What you say about me doesn't matter. My salvation is settled forever in heaven with Jesus. I'm good with Jesus. I'm, I'm good. I, I, I'm, I'm going to keep moving forward with him. But I don't want anybody else to miss it. So we have to move forward with this. His goodness means the uprightness of heart. Faith means conviction of truth. It means consistency. It's the character by which one can be relied on. Jesus Christ himself is faith. He is truth. Meekness means humility and mildness. Moses was the meekest man in all the world, but yet he was, he was the most mighty, but he was humble before God. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to stop there. First Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to read this whole thing. It says, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have faith that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself around, love is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Look at your neighbor and say, I need to rejoice in truth. That's the thing, we need to rejoice in truth. Okay, it goes on here. It says, love it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. And whether there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now I see, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know just in, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Folks, we have got to walk in greater love. There's no way around it. These days, all kinds of events are taking place. All kinds of circumstances are happening. And I'm not prophesying any of this to you. I'm not prophesying this over you. I'm just telling you we live in a fallen world and bad things happen to good people. And sometimes those good people are our family, are our friends, are our loved ones. Sometimes bad things happen. We don't want that, but sometimes they do. The only way the church is going to move forward in love is understanding there is an eternal perspective we have to have. And we have to allow Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. Because he will lead us to be able to walk in a greater love. He will lead us to be able to step into a place to where the fruit of the Spirit is growing off of us. When Jesus went to the fig tree, he went looking for what? Fruit. Fruit. He went looking for fruit. And when he came to the fig tree, and the fig tree was barren, what did he do? He cursed it. Because he came looking for fruit and didn't have fruit. Listen, far be it from us that our king would come looking for fruit and he not find fruit on us. 
We want to be in a place where the fruit of the, of the Spirit of God is evident in us. We speak well of one another. We speak well of even our enemies. We speak well of them. We love them. We, we literally want their best for them in their life. Even though they may say all kinds of horrible things about us, we still want the best for them. I mean, I, I truly believe this. There, there is an eternal perspective that we have to understand. Now, I'm going to read this to us, and then I'm going to go ahead and close. But this is what the early fathers said. St. Basil the Great. It said, a fearful man is a slave, whereas one who has become perfect in love has reached a dignity of a son. The slave is also called a tramp because he has nothing of his own, while a son is rich because he is the heir of his father's wealth. You are perfected in love. St. John Chryosotum literally said, where there is love, there is great security and God's great blessing. Love is the mother of all blessing, the, their, their root and source. It's the end of wars and the extermination of strife. Indeed, just as the descent and strife cause, uh, just as descent and strife cause death and demise prematurely, so love and harmony produce peace and unanimity. And where there is peace and unanimity, and all, all in life is safe and secure. Why speak of the present only? Love brings us heaven and, and unspeakable goods. It is the queen of virtues. He went on to say, love covers many sins. That's found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. On the contrary, animosity makes one suspicious of things that does not exist. It is not enough that it is not enough to be an to, it is not enough to be an enemy. You must also increase in love. Remember that this is what Christ commanded that it is enough. St. Justin the Martyr said we ourselves I'm sorry, we ourselves were well conversant with war, murder and every evil thing. But all of us throughout the whole wide earth have traded in our weapons of war. We have exchanged our swords for plowshares, our spears for farm tools. Now we cultivate the fear of God, justice, kindness, faith, and the expectation of the future given, to, given us through the crucified one. The more we are persecuted and martyred, and the more, the more do others ever increase in numbers and become believers. He went on also to say, we who formerly hated and murdered one another have now given so that we may share at the same table. We pray for our enemies and try to win those who hate us. That right there speaks a lot, folks. And there's other things just due to time I'm not gonna read. But we have to understand we must step forward in the things that God has for us. I'm also going to read this. It says, one of, this is uh, Origen, uh, who was, a, who was a, a, a father in the faith. Um, it says, we have become sons of peace for the sake of Jesus Christ, who is our leader. That's what we're to do. That's what we're to be. Is that we would become sons of peace, daughters of peace, just as Jesus was. That's what we're called to be. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. You know, there's all kinds of things going on right now in the world. All kinds of offenses. All kinds of situations and circumstances that's trying to take out the church. But you know what? We live in a time right now where, folks, we want to make sure that everything we do is calculated according to the word of God. Not according to ourselves. Because if you do something according to yourself, and if it's this for that, I forget how that saying goes. But, you know, when we look for something and, and someone does us wrong, and so we do them wrong and they do us wrong and we do them wrong, you know, when we live like that, we're living subpar. We are living subpar to what Jesus has called us to. And we're to live in a place where we live selflessly before the world. And that means that we have to give up some things of our own will to be a living sacrifice to Jesus. You see, I want the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Here's why. Because that's the only thing that's going to separate me from every other person who acts like they're a Christian but is not. I want to be the real thing. The gifts, the gifts are without repentance. 
Anybody can have the gifts. Anybody, um, hear me out. Anybody can preach. Anybody can sing. Anybody can lay hands on the sick. Anybody can prophesy. Anybody can, can do miracles. Anybody can have signs and wonders. But no, not only people who have surrendered their lives to Jesus and allow Holy Spirit to live and abide within them and are building in that relationship with Holy Spirit, only those will have the fruit. Because the fruit, the character, is where the anointing is, is birthed at. It's where the anointing grows at. The gifts are given without repentance, but the fruit is given by surrender. Today, the Lord wants us to surrender those things that have held us back. Maybe we've been in offense with people. Folks, we, we, just, we are in such places now. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I'm looking at things and I'm thinking, wow, we are really just on a train barreling down the pike here, right towards the end of days type stuff. And I'm thinking it's just not worth holding on to. We, we've got an eternity before us. So I'm not saying he's coming back tomorrow. I'm not saying he's coming back 10 years. I have no idea. It could be 200 years, 500 years. I have no idea. But one day we're gonna go meet him. I do, I do know that. I'm, I'm certain of that. And when we meet him, we wanna be able to live in such a way that we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So if you're here and you have things inside of you that are still holding you back, if I could get the altar team to go ahead and come on up. If, if you're here and you still have things that are holding you back, we don't want that to carry on anymore. God wants to free you from those things. You may say, well, I've done this a thousand times. I've, I've repented and, and let go a thousand times. Well, do it until it sticks. My testimony on getting free from sexual sin was I kept going up, I kept going up, and 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 I thought these guys have to think I'm absolutely the slowest person on the face of the earth. But I kept going up, and I kept going up because I wanted my freedom. I wanted my freedom. I kept going up, I kept going up, and finally one day, it clicked. It was like everything in my mind, the things I had seen, it switched. And all of a sudden, my repentance was genuine because I moved away from that which had held me back. And I moved forward with him. And so what happens is, is that there's an anointing to set us free and to allow Holy Spirit to be our guide because there's this jungle out there. He's going to guide us through the jungle and we're going to walk in the fullness of the blessings of God. That's what we're going to do. So you're here today and that's you. I want to invite you to come on forward. If that is you, I just wanted to ask you, if you're here and you've got things in your life that you're saying, I still need to let go of some things, I want you to come on forward. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you're here today and you say, I really, I really want to be led by the Lord in this season. That's really what this is about. If you want to be led by the Lord in this season, there's a lot going on. We just want to pray in agreement with you that you will have a clearer understanding and that it's made so clear that you are able to move forward with the Lord and able to walk with him and able to hear his voice very clearly and know his word very distinctly so that you're able to move forward with him in this season. So both of those, if, you, if you're still things you're dealing with, I want you to come on up. If you, want to be, if you want to step into that place of deeper leading where you're led by the Lord in a greater capacity, I want you to come on up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to go ahead and pray. I want to pray for those who are watching online. Do I look at you, Asher? Okay. 
I just want to pray for those of you who are watching online right now in the name of Jesus. Everything that has tried to hinder you in the past right now in Jesus' name, that is broken off of you right now. Every lying spirit, every, every form of offense or trauma that has been given to you, been done to you in the name of Jesus, it is broken now in Jesus' name. And we speak peace over you, the fulfillment of the promise of God. And in Jesus' name, you have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to perceive what the Spirit of God is saying to you and you will be led by him and not your emotions in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being with us today in this service. Now listen, during this service, if you have been ministered to, there's something that happens when the spirit of God begins to move upon a person. He begins to draw us unto himself. And I want to tell you that today is a day of salvation. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you've accepted Him at one point in time and your relationship is no longer where it needs to be, then I would ask you to simply repeat this prayer with me. As we pray, I just repeat it with me and let's believe God. He is so faithful and He is so true. Just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. I repent of my sins. I ask for your forgiveness and your blood to wash me clean. I walk away from my old life and I walk into my new life. Thank you, Lord. I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time or if you've rededicated, please comment, let us know. We got some material for you. We would love to absolutely get this into your hands so that it would help you and strengthen you in your walk with the Lord. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.